like this. Good. Yeah, so one, one, two, one, two. <laughs> so Sean, what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I'll introduce him and uh, like we're coming into the interview and then, yeah. You let me know when you're ready, Sean. So you had a few surgeries today? Or? <laughs> yeah, there's, Amy Jones just texted me. Oh, she's funny. Yeah, she's, she's, a, she's hilarious. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> we're gonna watch it right now. Yes, we are going live. Let's oh, see if she's on. Oh, uh, she's on? I don't know. I'll say live on Facebook. Hi, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if she's there. No. Nope. Yeah. So we'll. I won't. I'm gonna turn. I'll turn it off probably about halfway through the interview, just so that people can see that like you did the interview and and uh, some of the questions we asked them will stop it because I want them to tune into the podcast. It's a little little teaser. Hmm. You know, yeah. People like it. We'll give them 15 minutes worth, and then that's it. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just. I, I'll I'll just tee off, and you know, we'll just start talking. Welcome, Pat Brisson. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you Thanks for being, for being here. here. Uh, so we're, I'm really appreciative of you coming over from Century City to, to talk a little bit about our favorite subject, hockey. Yeah, well, love the game, so I'm happy to be here. What do you love the most about hockey? Why, why did this sport grab you, and it's kept you your whole life? Yeah, well, you know, growing up in Quebec, I mean, Montreal, uh, you know, uh, my grandfather played the game. Everyone played the game. It was you think about it, it was right there for us. And, uh, you know, probably age two years old and start playing with a stick and a ball and then put skates on. And it, it's been like this for 50 years. So it's like breathing. It is for us. It is. Yeah. Honestly, it's part of my DNA, my genes and who I am. I mean, you really see that with the kids today who are making it into the NHL. They literally start they can walk and now they can skate. It's one after the other. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, you uh, you have to start young, and because skating is, you know, it's uh, we're not born to skate. You know, I guess we learn how to hardly, yeah, hardly, <laughs> hardly. It's like terrible for your body. It is. It is bad for. I I know that, and it's bad for your hips. That's for sure. And uh, I'm feeling it now. But yeah, it's true. Well, we had uh, Jason Snibby uh, on here, who's the king's uh, hip expert mm -hmm. and he said basically everybody who plays in the nhl has some form of a labral tear of their hip and it's just a question of when they're going to get it operated versus will they get it up i agree uh it, it happened to me i didn't play in the nhl but i played hockey for a long long time and i had you know hip issues of, you know 15 years ago i had to take care of it True. absolutely but you still love the game it's yeah. exciting yeah What's your favorite part? Is it the goals? Is it the strategy? What, what, when you're watching a game, what are you thinking? I can't wait for this. It's, uh, you know, the beauty of, uh, I like the offense. I mean, I like, uh, the creativity, the speed, uh, you know, I think year after year now, our athletes are just so fantastic to watch. I mean, uh, and you appreciate the game more and more when you get closer to the ice and see how fast it is. Now, I mean, I used to back, well, when I played, I remember being a, a left winger and a right winger at times and uh, in your own end, before the puck came to me, I had to know what to do before it came. And I remember even 10 years ago, sitting close to the ice and trying to put myself as a winger off the wall in your own end and thinking, okay, what do I do if it comes to me? And the speed was unbelievable. And how where it's it's amazing. It's and, and the beauty of it is, yeah, the speed and the create uh, the, the creation and the beauty of uh, watching the way also players can shoot the puck today. Mm. The technology, the, the sticks, the way they are, the way they can snap and bend those the sticks, and the strength, the core the strength of players, and it, it's it's great to watch. It's unbelievable. It is. It's a it's a set of skills that is. Uh, it's not natural to do any of the things really involved in hockey. No, it, it's not. And that's why it takes years and years of being able to learn how to do it on skates, you know, on skates, on skates, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's nuts. Yeah. Special. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's what I've always loved about is the speed of the game, but you've, you've watched this game uh, as a, as an, 
you know, tell, tell us a little bit about how things changed for you. You were a player mm -hmm. and then had a realization because I know Francais. Oui. Uh, and it was very interesting. Um, so you were playing and then all of a sudden you realized like this wasn't going to happen. Yeah. That the NHL wasn't in your future. Yeah. How did you, how did you really come to the business of hockey as your career? I mean, I, I, I read your article, but, mm -hmm. but tell us, you know, briefly, what was really the, the moment that you said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take care of these players. Yeah. Um, first of all, like I grew up, I wanted to be an NHL player. It was uh, my dream. Every time I went to bed, I want to, I saw myself playing in the NHL um, I start to realize a little bit when I was in my third year of major junior <clears throat> and in my fourth year that, oh, I'm not drafted. Uh, I got a, I had a tryout with the Montreal Canadiens. But you kind of feel as a player, you kind of know where you fit, where you're at, where you're going. And when I went to play in Europe, I came back. I knew that at, at that time I was 21 years old and, had, you know, a lot of players who were going to be in the NHL they were already signed to AHL contract or IHL contract back then. And so so right around that time, I started to realize that my dream of playing the NHL was almost gone. gone. And um, and uh, when I came back from Europe, I came to visit uh, Luke Robitaille. He, would, he was in his rookie year in L.A., and uh, he was actually doing great. He was on the pace of 45 goals season, and he was actually named wow. the rookie of the year that year. And so came to visit Luke and Steve Duchesne, who were former teammates, and uh, came in for two weeks to visit them in the playoffs. The Kings were eliminated pretty quick, and I ended up. We ended up staying for six weeks, and you know, uh, <laughs> spending time in LA and all that. And I, I kind of saw some opportunities being here. So, wow, this is uh, way different than what I know about uh, growing up. And then Luke uh, and Steve were taking me to from place to places and meeting people and all that. And we couldn't speak English at that time. It was interesting looking back. And uh, we were, um, and then that's how I, I, you know, I realized and Luke and invited me to come and stay. He said, why don't you stay here? Why don't you come back and stay here? I said, no, I'm, I'm a hockey player. I got to go back and play. And and I uh, that summer I went back to Montreal. I had a tryout. And then I went to – I was going to go to Europe again. And I – something – Click in my head. I was at a training camp with uh, the AHL team, uh, Montreal Canadiens, uh, Sherbrooke team, and Pat Burns was the coach. Who was my former coach. In Pat was my coach in junior, and he was a coach there. And then uh, <clears throat> Pat had a lot of time for me. He was patient for me, but for some reason, I was having a, an okay camp, and I felt like you know what? What am I going with all this? I can go back to Europe and play, or uh, Lucas gave me a chance to come and live to LA in LA and maybe start teaching, doing hockey camps and stuff like that. And uh, so I got on the plane on October 15th, 87, and I came here. He picked me up at the airport. It was a Thursday. They were playing the Boston Bruins, I remember, and he went for a pregame nap, and I went for a jog. It's in uh, in uh, Brentwood, and I said, okay, this is it. I'm not going to be an NHL player. It's over. I got to find out what I'm going to become. And, uh, and at that point, my eyes wide open. And I went to the game that night. I started talking to players. And I got involved in teaching hockey. And I got involved in building ice rinks. Yeah, the isoplex. Luke. Isoplex. It was one of our concepts that we created. But I didn't think I was going to become an agent at that time. I, I was always with players. It was I, The one thing I understood, the locker room well, I understood what players felt. Uh, after and during games and how a coach, uh, well, treated a player, how a player felt uh, during and after games and, 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 and so on and so forth. So so players were confiding to me a lot, you know, after games were talking and, you know, and uh, and I gave Luke a lot of credit because uh, at one point he says, hey, why don't you uh, – uh, why don't you get more involved with my career if you want to? And actually, there's, there's, there's true stories. If the first deal I did, and I told the story a few times lately. It's it's interesting. But he was doing uh, – it was at a time where players started to do some appearances in shopping malls and stuff. And they were doing uh, autograph signings for like, if, you know, uh, an hour or so. And So Luke came home one day. He goes, uh, he said, hey, I want to do this at the whatever mall. And, and they're paying me 500 bucks in that. I said, 500 bucks? I said, baseball players are making three, four grand from my understanding. And there you he go. Said, he said, why don't you give a call? He said, do you want to, you know, he says, uh, you know, uh, would you want to call them? And I said, oh, I will. And I I, uh, I asked for two grand 
And the guy told me, he said, oh, no, no, it's too expensive. He said, I'll say, well, Luke is not going to do for anything under $2,000. And the guy said, wait a minute, I'll, I'll give you 1500 And I said, okay, at 1500 we'll do it. And I came back to lose. I got you 1500 from 500 <laughs> So long story short, <laughs> again, he gave me half. And I said, wow, half, 750 Great deal. This is what I want to do. And really, that's, you know, that, that was the start. That's that was great. the start. So, man. Well, many of us who are professionals of some kind are, are just not good financial and business representatives for ourselves. I, I can attest to that as a, as a doctor. I'm mm -hmm. like one of the worst business people on earth. And so having somebody that can advocate for you is key, especially you, you don't know what your talent as a hockey player is worth, especially when you're 18 years old. I mean, the, 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 the kids that are coming out of the juniors, and mm -hmm. I, I use that term loosely because these guys are very mature in their brains. Yeah. Their hockey IQ is through the roof. And these they're young men, but they don't have the ability to advocate for themselves, and they don't know how to say, you know what, I'm worth this in the market because they probably just don't even know what they're worth. Yeah, and, and I would say 99%, almost 100% of the kids at that age, they don't even think about what they're worth. Uh, they, they are just thinking it, about making it. Yeah, about making it. What does it take to, what do I need to do in order to be an NHL player? Those are the ones you want anyway. You want players who at all costs, they want to become NHL players, and they're willing to do the little things right in order to become uh, a regular NHL players and the sacrifices that comes with it. So... On the business side, that's when we come in, and that's how we we advise the families and, and the players by virtue of that. And um, but the business has changed a lot, a lot. How has it changed? That's one of my questions. Yeah, so when you started, this mm -hmm. was a totally different job. Absolutely, because you know the communication. It's all about that. Back then, I mean, I used to <clears throat> we used to find out with a player what a player did uh, in the minors, probably a day or two. Later, after let's say there's a game on a Tuesday night, and we found out maybe on the Thursday what happened two days ago because there were no, there were no such thing as the internet. There's no such thing, so everything was slower. We we got involved with the contract negotiations. We rarely got involved with talking to general managers and or coaches about development and or ice time and or where does the, the player fit within the organization. So back then, probably ninety percent of my time was in contract negotiations and and maintenance probably 15 20 percent now it's the opposite the contract negotiations is probably 10 15 percent of our time the rest it's all about development and and uh, and, and and finding out where your players are at with within the rosters and trying to advise them how we can service them best so that they can concentrate on their game and give them the, all the tools they need in order to be successful because there's a lot of distractions today and and players today they need a direction more than a back in the days you had to find a way just find a way coaches didn't talk to them mm -hmm. and he didn't talk to you and you find a way you just and parents and were not in, involved now it's it's a total different thing you know parents are involved everyone wants to know and communication is key, and that's where we are um, most involved and listening and trying to find ways to, uh, again, give the best advice to our players in order for them to be successful in each of their, uh, you know, uh, strengths and weaknesses. And so you're doing a lot of service, mm -hmm. business service for your, for your clients, and, and they – they need that because who else are they going to look to? Who else knows this business like you? Well, they, they have their families a lot of times, and no one knows their kid better than, the, than their parents. You know, like when you go watch your son play at uh, six years old and then you watch him at 20 and you've been watching for 40 that's good. Uh, however, sometimes you can't see the forest from the trees. Like In other words, you need an outside voice. You need an outside even watching my sons play, at times I find myself as a parent, you know, like I get emotionally, I, how come he's not on the power play? How come he's not doing this? How come he's not treated? <laughs> like, and, of course, we're parents. So I understand parents. But also I have a different set of eyes from a business standpoint and understanding where the team's coming from and where the, the general manager's coming from. And the coaches, the coaches have enough pressure. I mean, a lot of times I hear them. The thing, I mean, coach doesn't like me, or he, does, he, he doesn't want me to succeed, or this or that. I mean, for the most part, I would say most, if not all, coaches want to win. They want to 
do the best they can. They're not all right, but uh, for the most part, they're trying to do the right thing. And and but there's a lot of pressure on everybody. So we had, it's all about learning how to navigate through this whole thing. Pressure is, I think, the understatement for some of these kids. I look at, uh, for instance, Kevin Connolly and I, mm -hmm. my co-host, who's got a big movie coming out, who uh, was unfortunately could not be here to, to do this. So maybe we'll do it again. Sure. But because uh, I know he's got 400 questions about John Tavares. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure he does. So we have a bet um, on Connor McDavid's season. Yeah. We, uh, Kevin Connolly believes that Connor McDavid will hit a hundred points this year, mm -hmm. this season, and I believe that he won't. And we've bet a Mastro's dinner on it that's been extended to a dinner with a steak to go, and then also John Blue, who was here, threw in a steak for my dog. Oh wow! So <laughs> Chi Chi, the two-pound chihuahua, was looking at a sixteen-ounce bone-in ribeye from John Blue. <laughs> if McDavid doesn't make a hundred points, okay. <laughs> I believe the pressure on that this kid is so tremendous because yeah. of the job he's been been sort of assigned to. Yeah, he's been yeah. From your standpoint as the agent, what do you say to Big David? If I don't know, he's not your client. No, you know. so no, if not. he if he were your client and mm -hmm. he's being asked to carry the Oilers at this point, what do you say to him? Well, the thing that's interesting, and I'm talking about, he's not a client, but I have a lot of respect for what he does, and uh, you know, he's tremendous. He's, he's a incredible. tremendous athlete, a tremendous player, and he. The thing about uh, the Connor McDavid's of the world, you can talk about the, the Crosby. The, and all those top, top, top players, and you know Austin Matthews, who was the same age as Connor. Now, um, they they grow up. I I call them. They have a special chip, you know. Um, and in Connor's case, he was probably five, six years old in Toronto with the pre on learning how to play with pressure. You know, at ten years old, he was playing with twelve-year-old kids and dominating. And you know, Sydney did the same in Canada. When I mean, Austin is a little different because he was in Phoenix in Arizona, but he, he he learned how to deal with that pressure when he went to the NTDP at fifteen and sixteen and showing all the other kids, hey. I'm from Phoenix, but I'm going to show you. That's pressure as well. So yes. any of those players, they, they have that special kind of pressure and that special chip in order to deal with it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be where they're at. So in Connor's case, he, he, he is special that way. Um, he had an amazing year last year. He signed a big contract. He knows what he needs to do. He knows what he's trying to do. It's a team sport. He's trying to do his best. And but he knows at the end of the day he'll be judged based on how the team is doing as well and how he's I mean it's but it, they're they're human you know we have to respect the they fact that they, they're human they go to bed at night like everybody else and but what separates them from the the pack is they can I don't know if they sleep at night whatever but they can <laughs> bounce back and make it happen again and again and again and that's why they're special and as far as forecasting whether Connor, Connor's going to score, I mean, have 100 points in the Oilers, who knows? I mean, it's still premature. I guess he's, he's on a good pace right now. But, uh, hey, it okay. comes with the territory. When you're a top, top player like that, you're going to be judged uh, based on your performance and your team performance, and you're in the public eye, and that's at the highest level. It's, rough. it's very rough. I yeah. Mean, I, I really think he's going to. The reason I – and I don't mean to disparage Connor McDavid's season. I think it's going to be an awesome season. He's still, like, one of the top scorers in the, yeah. in the league. But the reason I said I don't think he makes it to 100 was because I felt that the pressure was so great and that people will now – they they plan for Connor McDavid. Mm -hmm. You can you can see it. Yeah. And just like I think now people are planning for Stamkos uh, and Kucherov, yeah. and, and they're – their numbers are coming down because they weren't ready for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, and I saw one night when the last game uh, Getzlaff played against uh, the Tampa Bay before he went out with his injury, he stopped Kucherov and Stamco single-handedly. He was all over the ice mm -hmm. and just, you know, essentially tied a string to their backs and, and drove them both crazy. And They didn't score. Yeah. And so when you make a plan like that uh, for a guy like a McDavid or a Stamkos or a Kucherov, I think these guys have – there, there's a, a, a wall for them that's going to stop them a lot more so than if they're, you know, brand new to the scene. Nobody knows what to under the radar. That's so to right. Speak. And well, the hardest part is it's easier to stop a player from achieving than being the player who has to achieve. So, right. so if you're, it's easier to say tonight, like, oh, I'm going to stop a play. I'm going to focus on stopping a player than, oh, I'm going to score a couple goals tonight. You know. 
two I'm very not different saying things. two different, and I I respect both, but 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 to to be consistent every night and to be that guy who's going to have you know lead the league in scoring. So every night, you know that every night the team is lining up against you to stop you. If you're hot, if you have a hot hand and you've been going hard for the last 10 games, you have, let's say, eight goals and 15 points, you know, uh, the coach before the game will have your, your number. Your how, number. How, how are we going <laughs> to angle him out so that he's That's not right. going to play and we're going to close the gap on him? So, yeah, that comes with uh, – Yeah, it's tough. So, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that uh, – Chi Chi the Chihuahua is He's looking, really for, looking steak. for a, you know, she wants that 16 ounce or yeah. John Blue. So she, he, she's hoping that he gets a 99 point season. And that's, yeah. that'd be just, just fine. right on the, on the edge. <laughs> exactly. So, um, oh, and let me, uh, I think we need to knock off here. So if you want to see any more of this, you know, we'll have to, uh, 